Welcome to Exploring Computing. Today's video is Introduction to HTML, Grammar and Vocabulary in Human and Computer Languages. So at this point, you know that HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. And we've spent some time talking about what hypertext is, and we've spent some time talking about markup. What about languages? Now, of course, we all have an intuitive idea of what language is, but like, what is the relationship between a computer language and a human language? Is it the same thing? And so that's what we're going to talk about now. We're also going to learn some new grammar rules for HTML, so stay tuned for that. Okay, so both computer languages and human languages are the same in that they're both used for communication. But of course, one of them we're communicating with a human and the other one we're com communicating with a computer. So how does that play out? Well, when we're learning a new human language, there's two different things that we need to learn. We need to learn what the grammar rules are for that language, and we need to learn vocabulary for the language. And the same thing's going to happen in computer languages. We refer to the grammar rules as syntax, and we think about vocabulary as being similar to the computer science concept of semantics. And for human languages, vocabulary is arguably the more important of the two. So you know, if I'm stuck out somewhere and I don't speak Spanish and I say baño donde, people will figure out what I'm trying to say. Or if I'm somewhere in Japan and I say toire doko, you know, my grammar may be off, but people will figure out what I'm trying to say. And if they want to be helpful, they'll point to where I need to go. Now, unfortunately, for computer languages, the grammar must be perfect. That's less true for HTML, where you can kind of get away with some stuff. For the cascading style sheets, which we're going to be teaching you next lecture, your grammar needs to be close to perfect. And when we get to programming languages, your grammar absolutely has to be perfect. You can kind of think of it as some countries or some regions have a reputation where if your grammar isn't perfect, even though everybody knows you're looking for the bathroom, they're still going to say, well, I'm going to ignore you because your grammar's not perfect. Well, that's what the computer's like. Computer will be like, I know you're looking for the bathroom because I totally understand what you're saying, but like your grammar's wrong. And so I'm just going to sit here and not do anything. That's what the computer's going to do. Okay, there is some good news when learning computer languages versus human languages. And that is, the grammar is actually pretty simplified for computer languages compared to human languages, which can have some pretty squirrely rules. And the vocabulary is also much more limited. How limited? Well, it turns out for HTML, there are fewer than 120 HTML elements. And some of those are pretty specialized. So here's some examples of some elements which most of you will never ever need to know about. So the BDI and BDO elements are used to reverse text directions. So this is important when you're working with certain languages, and particularly if you have a web page that has languages that go left to right, and then you have quotes from languages that go right to left. But like, how far are you going to make those web pages? So, you know, if you're a language specialist, you might need these tags, but the rest of us are like, no, we don't need to know about these tags or elements. WBR, I didn't even know this existed until I went on the web page to count out how many tags there are actually in active use. Uh, this is used to determine where to break a word. So like, let's say you have a really long word like supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, and you're trying to tell the computer, if this does not fit all in a single line, where should I put the line breaks? Well, that's what the WBR is for. Yeah, I've never used it. And then track, this is used to indicate subtitles for audio. You might use it, but like I've never actually put audio on a web page before. Um, so, you know, depending upon what you're planning to do with your web pages, yeah, it might actually be quite useful. But for most of us, not so much. So there's a bunch of these that aren't very important. And then there's a bunch of them that are super obvious. So, like the P for paragraph, okay, that's pretty obvious. Article, that's used to create. An article, like for example, if you've got a bunch of articles in your blog, section, that's used to create a section. So some of them are totally straightforward and um, some of them aren't used at all. So it turns out there are 120. That's a moderate amount, but it's not a huge amount. And a lot of them are super easy or 
not going to be used. So the vo total vocabulary for HTML is actually pretty small. Okay, and we've learned some grammar rules for HTML. And again, in computer science, we refer to these as syntax rules. So for example, we learned that HTML uses tags, that the tags work in pairs with start tags and end tags, that the tags indicate elements. So remember, an element is basically the start tag, the end tag, and the contents. We learned that there's different rules for combining tags, um, that tags must be fully nested. So th that italic tag must be completely contained in the bold tag, or the bold tag must be completely contained in the italic tag. We can't sort of mix the two. What about some more grammar rules or more syntax rules? Um, are there rules for how the elements can be nested? Like which elements can go inside which? So we said the italic can go inside the bold, the bold can go inside the italic. What if I want to combine an H1? Remember, that's the largest size header with an italic. Are there rules for how that works? And the answer is yes. Um, unfortunately, as of HTML5, they've gotten more complex. The HTML4 rules are much simpler. So I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about how the HTML4 rules are. And you can kind of think of this as a good rule of thumb and a good way of thinking about things. So maybe sort of the equivalent of the English I before E except after C, which is a rule that people learning English sometimes hear, and it mostly works, except for when it doesn't. And so this is a good way of thinking about things, and mostly this will lead you in the correct direction. Okay, so in general, there's two main types of tags. There are what are referred to as text-level tags. These are sometimes referred to as inline tags. And these are tags used to indicate information about a word or a couple of words within a larger, say, paragraph. So the bold tag and the italic tag are examples of this. So there's also this subscript tag and the superscript tag, which you might use if, uh, if you're creating a document about math, but, you know, many of you won't use those. But anyway, so there's a bunch of these tags that are designed to take a couple words, a couple letters, and do something with them. Those are called text level or inline tags. And then there are the block level tags. The block level tags, as the name sort of suggests, are used to create blocks of text. So this would be like the H1, remember that's our large size header, the H2s, the H3s, all the headers, the paragraph tag, and other tags. Um, we'll see there's like table tags, create tables. There are tags, create lists of items. These are all block level tags. There are also a set of tags that, as far as I know, don't have an official name but I think of it as structural tags, and those are tags like the HTML tag, the head tag, and the body tag, and we're not going to worry about those for this discussion. All right, so between the text level and the block level tags, so if I've got uh, a bunch of text, and in the midst of that text, I have a bunch of text level tags. For example, maybe I've got some bold tags and some italic tags mixed in. I refer to that as phrasing. If I've got a bunch of text and I've got block level tags as well as inline tags in there. I refer to that as flow. And so what we've got is we've got certain tags we're allowed to place phrasing in, meaning I can put text and text level tags or other elements I can put flow in. So if something's indicated as this can only contain phrasing, that means it can't contain block level tags. So you can have a bold tag and a italic tag in there, but you can't have a paragraph in there. If something can contain phrasing, that means you can have the bold tag and the italic tag in there. You can also have paragraph tags. You can have table tags. Basically, you can have any of the tags that actually create content on the web page. That doesn't mean you could have an HTML tag in there or a head tag in there or a body tag. Those, those don't count, but you can have any of the content tags like the bold tag, the italic tag, the paragraph tag, the heading, the H1 through H6 tags, um, table tags, that all counts as flow. Okay, so block, all block table level tags may contain phrasing. So like if you've got a paragraph, you could totally have bold tags and italic tags and that's totally fine. Text level tags may not contain bold level tags. So You've got an uh, italics element. It cannot contain a paragraph element. We've got a bold tag. That bold element it's defining cannot contain a paragraph in it. That's illegal. 
some block level tags may contain flow. So here I've got the article tag. Um, as I mentioned earlier, article is used to indicate um, it's going to be used on a web page that maybe has a bunch of different articles. So an example of this would be if I've got a blog and I've got a bunch of entries for my blog on the same page, I could mark each of those entries as articles and then I could contain flow, meaning within those articles, I could have a bunch of headings, H1 through H6. I could have tables. I could have paragraphs. You know, I could put basically anything within the article. So article is an example of a block level tag that can contain flow. Some block level tags can't contain flow. They can only contain phrasing. And so an example of this would be an H1 tag. So remember H1 is used to create a heading to indicate a heading on the web page. Um, if I've got an H1, that's my largest size heading. It doesn't make sense to say, oh, you know, okay, so a normal use of the heading would be like H1, Stanford history. So that indicates I should have a large heading on the top of my web page that says Stanford history. Does it make sense to say H1, um, hey, I've got three paragraphs in my heading and I've got a table in my heading and, um, you know, I've got a block quote in my heading. That that makes no sense at all. So the H1 is an example of a block level tag that can contain phrasing, meaning I can have text and text level tags. So I could have Stanford and then I could have history where history is in italics. That would totally be legal. But again, we can't contain other block level tags in it. Okay, here's a more complex version. Basically, the more complex version is look it up. So I provided you with a handout Appendix A from the CS105 course reader, and um, it doesn't have all of the tags in it. I think I've got, uh, I haven't counted up, but I probably have about 40 of the 120 tags in there. They're a good start, and they're the ones that are most commonly used. Anyway, so if, if you look at that document, you will see that it actually lists categories that a particular element fits in. So we can see here that a paragraph counts as flow content. So remember what we said earlier, there's phrasing and then there's flow. And so a paragraph counts as flow and you can see that a paragraph can contain phrasing content. So, so far so good. That matches our, our little rule that we just told you. So this is an example of the I before E except after C English rule, except for it actually works. But we're about to see there's a bunch of times when it doesn't work. Okay, this is new in HTML5 um, and kind of unfortunate, but basically HTML5 went off and defined a whole bunch of new category types. And so you can see that the A headings, H1 through A6, they count as the flow content. Okay, that's what we saw before, but actually they have their very own category, which is heading content. So there's things like, um, there's an H group that can be used to create uh, headings where you've got a major heading and then you've got a subheading. So this would be sort of like if you have a title for your novel and then you have a subtitle, that's what you would use the H group for. And the H group can only contain heading content. So it could contain H1 through A6. Yeah, it does allow us to have more interesting, more complex stuff, but it just sort of it just adds a lot of complexity here. Basically, you now have to look everything up. And you can see here, it didn't quite fit on the slide here, but, uh, you know, article, it counts as flow content, but it also, there's this new category called section content. So there's no easy way to learn the new rules. You're going to have to look it up. You can look up a lot of them in Appendix A. And then if you really get into it, of course, you can look in the official standard and see what the grammar rules there are. Um, I did want to mention another thing related to our grammar rules. And I am referring to them as grammar rules here, and they are grammar rules. But in computer science, we usually refer to them as syntax rules. So um, get used to that name, syntax rules, particularly if you learn a, a programming language. Okay, so here's another grammar or syntax rule. Beware of angle quotes. Look at these two quotes that I have here. So in the top quote, I say, have hello, everyone. And in the bottom quote, I have hello, everyone. But look at those quotation marks. The bottom quotation marks are straight and the top quotation marks are angled. So the left quotation mark and the right quotation mark are different. Here's the thing. Those are actually different Unicode characters. 
So um, I'm showing Unicode using the common designation, which actually uses hexadecimal. It's just one of five students. You haven't seen this, but you'll see this in a couple of days. Uh, so for now, you just have to take my word for it. But those are different codes. Those are different binary sequences. So the binary sequence for the angle left quote is different from the binary sequence for the um, right angle quote, which is totally different from the binary sequence for the non-angle quote. And only the non-angle quote is legal for syntax purposes for HTML. So be super careful of this. Um, you'll also discover, like, if you copy and paste from things like uh, PDF files, weird things will happen because PDF can contain um, some different interesting characters there that perhaps the author did not originally create. So just be, be aware of that. Um, so here you see I have two versions of my ahref um, linking the word Stanford to the Stanford homepage. Notice that the top version has the non-angle quotes and the bottom version has the angle quotes. The angle quotes version will not work at all. And again, these quotes will often get generated automatically by word processors. And this is another reason why I strongly recommend you use a something that's a text editor when you're working with HTML that is specifically designed for programming use as opposed to something that maybe gets used for text editing, but also has some features of word processors because those word processors documents will think, oh, I, you know, these, these angle quotes look really cool. I think that you'll, I think you're really going to like these angle quotes. It's going to make your document look much nicer. And then if you're actually typing HTML, you're screwed. So they do look cool though, but don't use them. Bad things will happen. Okay. So this seems like a lot of grammar to be remembering. Here's the bottom line. Validate everything. We've mentioned this before. Run things through the validator. The validator is going to tell you if there's something wrong. If you've got those angle quotes instead of the non-angle quotes, the validator is going to tell you. If you're using some HTML element in a way that's actually illegal according to the HTML5 rules because you didn't look it up, well, the validator is going to tell you. So definitely validate everything. All right, so next lecture, we're going to take a look at cascading style sheets and we'll really be able to spice up our web pages and do all sorts of fun formatting uh, once we've learned cascading style sheets. I'll talk to you then.